One of the beauties about a story like The Prodigal Son is that there are notes that resonate across the generations. All of us, for example, have awkwardness in our families. Some of us, a lot of awkwardness. No family is without its drama. Many of us know what it's like to want to run away. Some of us ran away as children. I think I ran away as far as the Sherman's house next door before looking behind my shoulder to see if my mother was still watching me. She was. Some of us have run away quite happily and permanently as adults, and others of us have been kept away by our families. I'm guessing, us that all of, I'm, I'm guessing that all of us have had serious annoyance with our parents before, or even anger or frustration with our parents. I'm also guessing that many of us parents have faced moments where we truly have no idea what to do with our ridiculous children. And then there are the siblings. There is nothing quite like a sibling. If you don't have a sibling, it will take someone who might be sitting next to you approximately 10 seconds to tell you why a sibling is the actual best and worst thing that can exist. She may be your best friend, or is she your arch enemy? It's kind of comforting to me that family dysfunction is a real theme in the Bible, especially when the siblings get involved. There's the story where one of the famous biblical twins, Jacob, puts on a costume, fools dad who's half asleep, and then hornswoggles the inheritance out of him. His brother Esau is understandably enraged. Then there's the Bible story where one brother, Joseph, gets a fancy snazzy new coat from his dad, and the other siblings get so mad about it that they throw him into a pit. I assume that's what happens when you have something like 12 older, older brothers. Martha, the sister of Mary, she seethes in the kitchen while she's washing dishes, and her oblivious sister, who never picks up the broom, is compared against her. Interestingly, let's all just take notice that the younger siblings sure do get a lot of attention and extra TLC in these Bible stories. Moreover, not only are the younger kids the family faves, they're also successful, handsome, smart, visionary. They have stunning portfolios, excellent business acumen, and $100 haircuts. These biblical babies are shining stars. King David, he's the youngest of seven. King Solomon, he is the second born to David and Bathsheba. Isaac, the beloved son of Sarah and Abraham, is younger than his brother Ishmael. No, I don't have a bone to pick with biblical birth order. I have a point to make. That when Jesus begins this also oh favorite parable with the line, there was a man who had two sons, that everyone that was seated there around him listening would have settled comfortably into their seats because they knew their Bible stories and they knew exactly how this story was going to turn out with the shining star youngest child. That is until the story went off the rails. When the, younger, when the younger son left home to see the world, which is, by the way, what young people do all the time these days, he had a lot of fun, and then things went very bad. He burned through his whole college fund, his whole inheritance in riotous living. He's greedy and dumb and makes a lot of bad choices. Perhaps par for the course for many of us who were also young and foolish when we first set out to conquer the world. But while he may not have gained riches, he does seem to have gained wisdom. If we could call it that, or maybe we'd call it sneakiness. And after he has lost everything, he returns home where dad is overjoyed that his favorite kid is home, the baby of the family. All is forgiven, and his dad throws him this epic party. This is the part of the story where we point out that the older workaholic brother is pouty and won't forgive his brother and get over it and come to the party. You know, folk stories that are grouped into trios have always been good at the plot twist. Think of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. The first chair was too small, the next chair too large. The first bowl of porridge too hot, the next one too cold. It's always the third one that is just right. The same goes for the Billy Goat Scruff, the Three Musketeers, the Three Little Pigs. Leave it to the third pig to build the house made out of bricks, trick the wolf, and get it right. In today's story, told by Jesus, in quick succession after two other stories about losing things, the lost sheep and the lost coin, the rule of three does not disappoint. In the first of the three stories that we heard about in last week when we were in church, the shepherd goes out to look for his lost sheep, and he finds it. In the second story, the woman turns over the house, top to bottom, looking for her lost coin, and she finds it. 
In the third story, the son that the dad goes looking for is not the merry prodigal son who's just come home from his escapades with his tail between his legs. No, the dad goes out to search for the older son who he, scripture tells us, forgot to invite to the party. Oops. Well, I can affirm that there was something that was most certainly lost about the younger prodigal son. Given the shape that our world is in right now, the second half of the story has me thinking. You see, there's something very comfortable about having an enemy. When we're face to face with things that are stressing us out, it's nice to know that there is someone to blame. It's convenient to have a scapegoat. It's so nice, in fact, that we are good at creating enemies. For example, there were a series of studies over the last few years that showed that when you tell uh, folks in this country that technology and automation is taking jobs, people become more anti-immigrant. Instead of directing their feelings of frustration towards the tech or the people that made the tech, people across the political spectrum direct their anger at a human scapegoat because it's nice to blame someone. When the dad in this story leaves the prodigal party to look for his lost son in the field, he finds him and the son lets loose. Years of frustration and anger and resentment come bubbling over. Now, before we jump to some sort of desire for everyone in this family to just hug it out, let's acknowledge that no one that is listening to this right now, right here today, is a stranger to human dysfunction or is a stranger to making enemies out of each other. Whether it's a parent that favors a certain child or an inability to talk about how we are jealous or hurt or why we feel awkward or left out or scared, we all know that relationships can be a real mess. And while sure, relationships can be bruised by misunderstanding, there's also a lot of human sin, like judgment, pride, and arrogance that can cut relationships and wound them. Here's the thing that I could not stop thinking about this week with this Bible story of the prodigal son. The son, or both of the sons, are not the only thing that is lost in this story that Jesus tells. When we hurt each other, when we take advantage of each other, belittle one another, fail to appreciate one another, or build each other up, when our ego is convinced of how blameless we are, we lose something. Something was lost in that field that day. We lose connection, trust, and accountability. We lose our sense of peace. It's just gone like that. Zoom out a little bit and take a wider view of this dysfunction. And when we get caught up in our money or our stuff, when we make each other the enemy, when we're snide or disparaging, when we are judged by one another, when we're addicted to cynicism, when we're stingy, when we won't share, when we are in need and there's nothing, nothing there for us, when we stop deeply caring about our neighbors, when the one who is hurt is forgotten. Something cracks. We lose something. Justice crumbles. We lose our vision of a world animated by God's love. If we are working to build this world that God calls us to, then we've got to take a look at what's getting in the way of that. Sin isn't some kind of rule that we break that we need to get punished for, that we get some sort of demerit for. It's something that robs us of the kingdom of God. It closes our minds. It makes us not care. It hardens our hearts. It distracts us from what matters. And in the grip of dysfunction, we lose one another. We lose track of God. Thankfully, the dad in today's Bible story had the foresight to realize that he had spaced on inviting his child to the party, and he went out to go and look for him. Heaven only knows how long they stood there in the field talking that day, with the son furious and spitting out his hurt and his frustration and his truth there to his dad. His dad tried. We get a little bit of that conversation that's recorded in Scripture. Child, the dad says to him, 
It's the same word, that word for child, that is uniquely used when Mary and Joseph lose 12-year-old Jesus in the temple and then they find him and Mary says, child, when she finds him, we were so worried about you. Faced with so much brokenness and so much that has been lost, we must wrestle back the tools that we need to get us closer to God. We must wrestle back compassion and a desire to understand one another, a deep humility. We must struggle to practice generosity and patience and forbearance. Even if we grit our teeth while doing it, we have to practice it like a muscle in order to make it stronger. We must wrestle back grace. And you are the one who knows what that looks like in your own life. Because grace comes before change and God has asked us to change this hurting world. When we think about what kind of world we want to build, and here in this congregation, we're gonna think and talk more about that this fall. We know as humanity that we are not there yet. The poet Cleo Wade writes, we say to the world, please change, we need change. But how do we show up to change in our own lives? How do we show up to change in the lives of the people in our communities? Something has been lost. There the dad and the son stand deep in conversation while the party music drifts down into the field. How do the two men resolve it? Well, Jesus doesn't tell us in this story. And given that you know this challenge as well as I do, I guess I'll say, how do we resolve it? What does that look like in your life? You tell me. <laughs>